I only have today and next Shabbat, and then I'm done with the replacement theology teaching. I'm going to be teaching today how replacement theology has affected the Feast of Tabernacles. And then next week is going to be one of your favorite. I'm going to teach about replacement theology, where the Shabbat was changed to Sunday. And so a lot of you will be able to have <clears throat> some real good biblical proof of why the Shabbat is on the Shabbat. Okay, so right now, as we have here, replacement theology has turned Yeshua from this into this. Ah, it's right. And then they, Christians wonder, well, why don't the Jews recognize him? I mean, first off, he's got a bad case of arthritis, as you can see. Now, I don't know how many of you were here when I talked about this, but of course, the early Catholics like this kind of a painting, that's what it comes from. It was interesting. How many of you were at the Rosh Hashanah service last night at Urban Grace Church uh, in that back area where we had the, the little store where you could get stuff there? They had these kind of pictures all over the place. It was hilarious. But anyway, that little hand thing that he has there, the Catholics wanted to incorporate all of paganism so everyone would feel like a Catholic, which means universal. But that hand signal there, or the hand sign, comes from both the Hare Krishnas and the Buddhists. Uh, there's like a billion people from Hare Krishna and about 500 million Buddhists. Well, that came, uh, the Hindus from 2000 BC that started, and with the Buddhists around 500 BC that was used. And so <clears throat> we see here that this is uh, supposed to be Jesus, and, and there's no J's in Hebrew, there's no J's. In Greek, there's not even a J in English until the 1600s. Uh, but this is what replacement theology has done. Well, what else has it done? It's turned the birthday of Messiah, which is on the Feast of Tabernacles in October, into Christmas. Okay, and, and so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the birth of the Messiah, King Messiah. So let's start here in the little town of Bethlehem. Well, guess, or how many of you have heard of Bethlehem? How many of you know the Hebrew word for Bethlehem? Beit Lechem. And what does Beit Lechem mean? House of bread. Beit is house, we know from the letter Beit. Lechem is bread. Imagine that. The bread of life was born in the house of bread. What a coincidence. But we're going to talk about the birth of King Messiah and the way we actually can figure it out. I, I was raised a Catholic, which is why I can be hard on Catholics. I was Catholic for about 19 years. Uh, studied to be a priest. But, uh, uh, oh yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd never heard that. Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, I went to an all-male high school. I left home at 13 years old. And uh, I lived at the school. It was like a dorm, you know, that type of school. And so I was there for four years. I was about 200 miles from home, so I never could go home except during the summer. And as a 13-year-old, all of a sudden leaving home, it's uh, kind of traumatic for at least the first couple of weeks, and then I, yay! But, uh, yeah, it was a high school prep seminary to study to be a priest, as uh, what I did. And then after I graduated from high school, I said, forget this, I want to get married. <laughs> so I, I went to a Catholic college for a year, uh, and then uh, I really felt like, no, the Lord wants me in the ministry, so... Uh, I was very familiar with monasteries and monks back then, too. So I thought I wanted to be a Trappist monk and go to Gethsemane, Kentucky. Can you imagine me never talking? <laughs> 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 I'd have failed bad. But uh, so what was fascinating, they said, okay, you're going to a year at college. I want you to go at least two years. Go one more year, and, and then we'd love to have you here in Gethsemane. I said, great. Well, that summer I got saved. 
And uh, so the Lord called me into a ministry, but it wasn't into the priesthood. But I had, I don't know if I've ever told you this one story I had, when, uh, why I felt God called me into the priesthood. You guys got a second? It's amazing. I should have my, I have a little PowerPoint I made to go over this, but I'll just tell you. I grew up in a small town of 800 people. How many of you know, in a town of 800 people, everybody knows? Everybody. Not only that, these were good Catholic families. Some of them had 18 kids. Okay? The reason they had 18 kids, they were farms. They want free labor. It's always about the money. Okay? No. We couldn't be a farmer because my dad was crippled. He became a tax accountant for the farmers. But uh, in this small town, everybody, especially if you're in high school, you know, grade school, er, er, you know all the kids in the whole neighborhood. Everybody knows everybody. And I was the, I had five older sisters, two older brothers, and a younger brother. So nine kids in the family. And... uh, Can you imagine this? My mom and dad were 30 years old and already had nine kids under the age of 13. It's a good Catholic family. Can you imagine being 30 years old and having nine kids under the age of 13? Could mom get a job? No. She had a full-time job. Okay. My younger brother, who's a year younger than me, was a newborn, and I was like 18 months I mean, she had like three kids in diapers at the same time, half the time. It was just insane. But anyway, <clears throat> my dad is in the old VW van back in 57. Uh, you know, those VW vans with no front, you know. And they didn't have seat belts then. And he's going about 60 miles an hour uh, at night, about 10 o'clock at night, because they didn't really have speed limits back then either. And a drunk had a vehicle in the lane, but... He wasn't there. He ran out of gas and just left his truck on the highway. So my dad in his VW van at 10 at night going 60, 70 miles an hour plows right into the back of this truck. And you're in a van. You're just standing up and there's nothing in front of you but a piece of metal. There's, there is no engine. And so he plows into the back of that. <clears throat> and his right leg, which is stomping on the brake, okay, his femur was completely shattered and gone. His hip was completely shattered and gone. And uh, he was, uh, his head kind of went through the roof, his foot through the floorboard, and he was in a full body cast for three years. Medicine isn't like it is today. But can you imagine, 30 years old, in a full body cast for three years, and mom, who has a husband in a full body cast, has nine kids to take care of, too. No income. The guy had no insurance. Dad can't work. Mom can't work. Us kids can't work. We're all under 13 years of old, so we had absolutely no income. Talk about poor. We used to joke, yeah, look up at the dictionary, the word poor, and say, see, the Bills family. But um, because after my dad got out of the hospital, no one wanted to hire a cripple back then. And he would try everything. He he tried uh, real estate, uh, but in our small Catholic German town, he sold a house to a black person, and they said, no way, and they booted him out. And then he sold it to a Jewish person, and they said, no way, and they booted him out. And so my dad says, good grief, what can I do? You know, so he's trying to find a job, and he ended up being a tax accountant. But uh, because mom and dad couldn't work, we, and because I'm only a year and a half, I don't know anything different. But the way we survived for about four years is people would just simply bring boxes of stuff to our house. That's how we lived. When my sister was in fifth grade, she had to wear boys' dress shoes because that's all that was in the box. You know, so we lived out of boxes for several years, but I thought everybody had boxes delivered to their house. I'm just, you know, I don't want any different. But uh, my dad, who's lost his femur, had to have a metal rod attached to his hip side. Uh, And so he had to decide if that metal rod was going to be fused straight down and he could never sit or straight out and he could never stand. And so he decided he wanted a stand. So they fused it straight down and his knee can't bend either. So he's got this locked leg completely and it was two inches shorter than his other leg. And so he had to pay for a built up shoe all the time. Well, when they got better meta- science. They could put an artificial hip in, and he could at least swing his leg then, you know, so it wasn't rigid. And when they were doing that, he asked them if they could lengthen that bad leg to get rid of the built-up shoe. 
The doctor said, no, but we can cut your good leg off and shorten it two inches. He goes, let's do that. So they go in, they slice open his thigh, they cut out two inches of bone, they put the bones together with metal brackets and nuts and bolts to hold together, and sew them back up. A couple months later, he falls and breaks it. They got to reopen it again, reset everything, sew them back up, and then a year later, they reopen them again and take all the brackets and the nuts and the bolts out and put them back together. So at least now he can swing his hip and also not have the built-up shoe. So anyway, so he was just a lot of pain his whole life, you know. Well, at, we basically, uh, and both my parents are in heaven, whatever, they're gone. But I was uh, felt, because we never could get much attention, and because I'm the second youngest, I really felt like nobody loved me and I was going to go eat worms, you know. <clears throat> so I'm in eighth grade, and of course I'm going to run away, and I write this note and stick it on my bed where they can find it. Nobody loves me, I'm running away. And so I go run away about four blocks from us is a big wooded area with a creek and the train tracks go by it and the highway goes by it and it's about 10 o'clock at night my mom was gone to some retreat for the weekend just my dad was home with my brother who's a year younger in seventh grade and my sister who's two years older in high school everyone else is already grown and gone so we're the only three of the house and my dad and so uh, I run away, but I leave the note. So of course my sister and other brother calling for me. 10 o'clock at night, they're trying to find me, you know, and I have my backpack and my sleeping bag and I'm laying uh, out by the train tracks to get, I was gonna be like those old hobos. And uh, I've never heard that term, but I was gonna jump on the next train as it went by and get the heck out of here. So there, you always know if you're gonna run away, you're gonna go to the creek. Uh, and so I hear, my brother and my sister's voice and they're calling for me to tell us where you are and i'm laying down with my head on a pillow and all of a sudden i hear audibly like the police had these big megaphones it was like that loud and it was my dad's voice saying mark tell the kids where you are and i start just crying out to god god what am i supposed to do am i supposed to run away am i supposed to go home and i hear my brother and sister calling and i i'm crying out to god and i hear this loud booming voice again which sounded like my dad saying mark tell the kids where you are so finally i tell them where i am and they come running over and i ask them if they had heard that voice and was i in trouble with dad did he get the police and I'm gonna have to get put in juvie hall or something, you know? But my dad's crippled. And they said, no, dad's at home. He hasn't gone anywhere. We're the only two that are looking for you. And I go, well, did you hear that loud voice? No, we didn't hear a thing. And then out of nowhere comes a young man out of the wooded area right up to us. None of us had ever seen him before. None of us knew who he was and none of us ever saw him again. And he said, can I be of any help? And my sister said, well, my bro little brother's run away, but he's decided he's gonna come home. And this live gentleman we all saw said, good, home is where he belongs. And he took off at 10 o'clock at night uh, in the woods. Nobody, and so, you know, I really felt like uh, God was calling me to be in the ministry because of that. But I thought it was to be a priest, you know. And so that's why I joined uh, the priesthood. Uh, but then, but anyway, I've had a, a couple of things like that happen where I've literally seen things, heard things. Now, I can't say definitely what these things were, but uh, that's what keeps me motivated and going. Okay, but back to this. In Luke 1 through 5, it says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, what kind of a priest? certain priest and his name was Zechariah and he was of the priestly division of Abiyah which means of father Yah God my father is God that's his name he had a wife of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elisheva or Elizabeth well guess what Aaron also married a woman named Elizabeth in case you didn't know way back in the day but when it says the priestly division of Abijah 
What does that tell us? Well, if you know your Bible, if you go to 1 Chronicles chapter 24, and you look at verse 7 through 18, it lists the division of the 24 courses of priests and who was in charge of each course. And what do we find? The eighth course was given to Abijah, and the ninth course happened to go to Yeshua, which I thought was kind of interesting. But the eighth course is the course of Abijah. So can we, that's what it just says right there. So can we determine when this was happening? <clears throat> Look at Luke 1, 8 and 9. It happened while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to enter into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. Okay, he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his division or course, according to the custom of the priest's office, and he got the lot to enter into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And look what 1 Chronicles 24 says. These are the divisions of the sons of Aaron, the sons of Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eliezer, Itamar. Nadab and Abihu died before the father, had no children. Therefore, Eliezer and Itamar executed the priest's office. And we see in 1 Chronicles 24.10, the seventh went to Hakos, and the eighth went to who? Abijah. And in 24.19, these were the orderings of them in their service to come into the house of the Lord according to their manner under Aaron their father as the Lord God of Israel had commanded him. Okay, so everything was done unto the course from 1,500 years earlier was Moses. A 1,000 years earlier was David. David is the one who ordered these courses, and they have been kept for a 1,000 years at the time of Yeshua. Now, the interesting thing, what most Christians aren't aware of, where it says his lot was to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense, that refers to a lottery, a lottery. There were hundreds of thousands of priests and the incense was burned three times a day, okay? Or well, the morning and the evening, uh, let's say twice a day, morning and evening, they had to burn the incense. Well, you take twice a day times 365, you have roughly 700, but there's like 100,000 priests. They all want to be the one to burn the incense. And some, you only, when you did get to burn the incense, you only got to do it once in your entire life. You, you were taken out of the lottery because, you know, it, it would take you know, 100 years with all the priests to be able to do the, burn the incense. So here he is, and you know he's been wanting to burn incense. He's been playing the lottery of the burning of the incense. But see, they also had a lottery every day. Who was going to take uh, the sacrifices up to the altar? Who won the lottery to be the one to do the sacrifice? Who won the lottery to be the one to uh, take the ashes out? Every function of the priesthood was all done by a lottery. And so every day, because it's like being on a basketball team and sitting on the bench your whole life. Okay, so it's like they want to be in the game. So they were all praying that they could win the lottery, especially the incense, because then you got to go right up to the Holy of Holies. I mean, that was the number one thing. And here he probably feels like God didn't love him because he's old, he's, he's ready to retire, and he hasn't done it. And many of us sometimes feel like, man, our time has expired. But no, God is waiting for the perfect time just for you to answer your prayer. He's all about timing. And so how the courses went, when is the beginning of the religious cycle? Nisan 1. So to make this simple, Nisan is roughly our April. So look at, uh, on your notes at Deuteronomy 16, 16. It says, three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that's Passover, at the Feast of Weeks, that's Pentecost, or Shavuot, and at the Feast of Booths, or tabernacles. So everyone has to be there three times a year. Even if you were Jew in another country or whatever, that's why in Acts there were Jews from all these nations because they all had to be there for Shavuot. Okay, so the, what they would do, there's 24 courses. What's 24 times 2? 48. And then you have three weeks for Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles where all 24 courses would minister at one time. The reason why is, Jeru uh, for example, Josephus says in Jerusalem, there were two million people there for Passover. So they would need all hands on deck and all the priests would minister. So here we have the first course is going to be the first week of Nisan. The second course 
is going to be the second week. But guess what? Passover is the next week, so the people that served the second week also had to serve the third week because it's all hands on deck. And it's the same thing with the third course. The third course also had to serve during that uh, week as well as the third course. So some of them have to serve twice, two weeks in a row, based on if it's around a holiday. But typically, they would serve a week, and then six months later, they'd serve a week. Okay, that's how they would do their courses. So now, the, what comes after the third course? It's not hard. The fourth course. The fifth course. The sixth course. The seventh course. That takes you through the month of May. All right. And this is the counting of the Omer is what is going on. Because from Passover to uh, Shavuot or Pentecost, they have the counting of the Omer. So after the seventh course, what course comes? Good. <laughs> the eighth course. But what happens if you're serving the eighth course? Now comes Shavuot, Pentecost, and everybody has to serve the eighth course. And then comes the ninth course. Is everyone following me? Okay, so here, Zechariah is serving his course. And then the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, you're going to have a kid. And he says, well, I got to get home then. But he can't go home for another week. He's got to serve the whole week of Shavuot. And then he goes home. So here he is, serves the eighth course. And he serves that whole week. All right, and then... Everyone is there for Shavuot. It is a crowd. So here, can you imagine, again, a million people there, all right? And so every single course is serving. Well, let's look at this now. Let's go back to our notes. Look at Luke 1, 10 and 11. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense, and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Because he's doing the incense. I think the Greek word for multitude here is plethora. What does that mean? A lot. Why? Because it was Shavuot. When you understand the Hebraic mindset and you haven't replaced it with Christianity. You, and you know the courses. You know he's serving Shavuot. He had to... Doesn't it make sense for the Lord to come down on Shavuot, which is what he did back in the Exodus? He came down on Shavuot. And now, look at Deuteronomy uh, yeah, 16, 16. Again, three times everyone has to appear. That's why the place is packed at unleavened bread. It's packed at the Feast of Weeks, and it's at, packed at the Feast of Booths. And then it says in Luke 1, 23 through 24, it happened... When the days of his service were fulfilled, he departed to his house. And after these days, not months or years, but days, Elisheva, his wife, conceived, and she hid herself how many months? Okay, so here we are. And he has to serve the second course. And uh, then what do we see happens? He goes home with Elisheva and says, let's have a kid. Now, so... Yochanan is conceived here, or John. I say Yochanan because that's his real name. And anybody know what Yochanan means? Okay, let me help you. What is Canaan? Grace, mercy. Yochanan is God's mercy, God's grace. But when you say John, you don't get that. That's why you want to keep the Hebrew, so then you know, uh, know what means God's grace and mercy. Okay, so then this would be the ninth course, the 10th course, the 11th course. Now, she hid herself for five months, right? So if that was the middle of June, July, August, September, October, that's to the middle of November. She hid herself, okay? And now she's kind of showing and can't really hide anything. So then what happens, look at this next verse in Luke 1, 26. In the sixth month... The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Okay, well, let's look here. If the fifth month is November, when is the sixth month? December. And here we have Hanukkah, the festival of lights. This is when 
Noah's rainbow first appeared. Also. And this Messiah was conceived at Hanukkah. Because what do we see here? It says... In Luke 1, 35 and 36, the angel answers Miriam and says, The Holy Spirit will come on you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, also, the Holy One who is born from you will be called the Son of God. Behold, Elisheva, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is what month? With her who was called barren. We have another miraculous birth, just like we did earlier. Okay? With Isaac, with Samuel. Here we're hearing about another miraculous birth. And this is the sixth month, which means it's in the middle of December that Messiah is conceived. Look at Luke 1.56. Miriam stayed with her about three months and then returned to her house. Why did she stay three months? What, six months plus three months? How long does it take to have a baby? So she stays until John is born and he's born at Passover. And a lot of the Jews today believe Elijah comes at Passover. And John was a type of Elijah. Remember? And he appeared at Passover. That's when he was born. Okay. Now, if it's the sixth month for Yochanan in December, and late December is when Miriam conceives. Okay, here you have that cup of Elijah when he is born. But if you are in the end of December and you add nine months, what does that take you to? The end of September, which is when Sukkot is. Do you see how easy it is to determine Messiah was not born in the middle of winter on the December 25th. He was born on Sukkot. Now, there are Messianic leaders and other people that say, think he was born on Passover, You're going to see that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And I will prove to you why. Uh, No reflection on the teachers, but it's uh, it's just so dumb. Okay, Let's, let's, let's look. Let's look at what we got here. Okay. It says in Luke 2, 7. Six and seven. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. What happens on Sukkot? You got two million people there from all over, which is why there's no hotel rooms available. There would be all kinds of room if it was in the middle of winter. How many of you go to Alaska for vacation in the middle of winter? How many of you go to Hawaii in the middle of winter? Okay. And you go to Alaska in the middle of summer. It is stupid to think he's born in December and the inn not be, or the inn's full. No one goes there. Okay, so the very fact that there is no room in the inn proves you it was on one of the holidays, Passover, Pentecost, or Tabernacles. But we already know from the 24 courses, it had to be, okay, on Sukkot that he was born. Now, I don't know if you know about the swaddling clothes. Basically, the manger was a sukkah. All of the Jews have to be in a sukkah for the Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, that's what has to happen. As a matter of fact, look at this. In Jerusalem, look at all these sukkahs in a truck. They're all moving these sukkahs. Either they're living out of the sukkah in the truck or they're selling them somewhere. They even have sukkahs on camels that you can be in. Okay, everybody is in a sukkah. That's what a booth, something like that. Now, about the swaddling clothes. If you remember the linen garments of the priests, they all wore white linen garments, and they would never wash their clothes. And when their garments were so stained by the sacrifices, the blood all over it, then they would take those priestly garments that were stained with the blood of the animals for our sins, they would literally cut them into strips and they would be used 
for wicks for the big temple candles. Okay, they would, that, that would become the wick. But they would also take, the, all, they were like giant baskets in the women's court, and the women would take those strips home and use them to wrap their babies in. So the swaddling clothes that Jesus was wrapped in was the priestly garments that had been stained with their sins, the blood. That was the swaddling clothes. Here he's a priest wrapped in priestly garments stained from the blood of the sacrifices. When, yeah. Now, but wait, there's more. Look at Exodus 15 verse 2. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my what? Yeshua. He's become my Yeshua, and the voice of rejoicing and Yeshua is where? In the tabernacles of the righteous. Wow. So here we go. Here's the tabernacles, and Yeshua is now in the tabernacles of the righteous. This is Psalm 118, which is sung Every Sukkot for the last 3,000 years, they sing this Psalm 118. And so what happens? Yeshua is being born, and Joseph and Miriam are hearing, and they're singing, Wow! The Lord is my strength and my song, and the Lord has become my Yeshua. He's my God, and I'm going to prepare a habitation. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. And here this habitation is prepared. It's the Sukkah. Now look at Psalm 118, verse 24 and 25. It says, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will what? Why? Because God commanded them to rejoice. Can you imagine? God says for eight days, I don't want to hear no whiny whinies. You are going to rejoice for eight days. Why? Because he knew during the Feast of Tabernacles when my Messiah would be born. Can you imagine? The surprise birthday party wasn't for Yeshua, it was for all of Israel. What a big surprise. Yeshua is born. They don't even realize it. And they're seeing Yeshua is in the tabernacles of the righteous. And they don't even know that Yeshua is in the tabernacles of the righteous on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, look at Luke 2, 8 through 11. There were shepherds. Oh, let me show you this picture first here too. Everyone's commanded to rejoice. So they would have these big rejoicing parties celebrating Messiah's birth and they don't even realize it's his birthday. Look at Luke 2, 8 through 11. There were shepherds in the same country staying in the field. Where were they? Stay. They weren't just in the field. They were staying in the field and they were keeping watch by night over their flock And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. And the angel said, don't be terrified. Behold, I bring you good news of what? Which is why he commanded them to rejoice, because someday in the future, there's going to be great joy because the Messiah is born. And they say, for there is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Messiah the Lord. You are not commanded to rejoice during Passover. You are commanded to rejoice during Sukkot because that's when the Messiah is going to be born. Now, here we have the sheep and the shepherds are where? Staying in the field. If this happened around Christmas in Israel, you have freezing rain. I mean, it is cold. That's why we don't do tours in December and January and February because it's going to be Cold rain. The shepherds don't stay in the fields in the middle of December. All the sheep are put in their pens. Now, as a matter of fact, if you remember, they were in Nazareth and they went down to Bethlehem. Well, the, and Bethlehem is just a couple miles from Jerusalem. But can you imagine? It is 40 miles from Nazareth to Jerusalem. They didn't have cars back then. Okay, that's important uh, to realize. Would it be kind of the Father in heaven to have Miriam, who was over nine months pregnant, riding a camel 40 miles in the freezing rain and snow? Not going to happen. 
But what happens, the Feast of Tabernacles, they have huge caravans and multitudes and thousands are going to the temple. And so she just joins them in a, a nice wagon and they're all going together as a group. It's not like her and Joseph are alone riding a donkey or a camel or a horse. That would not be kind. As a matter of fact, here is a picture of Jerusalem in the winter. Here you go. Take a look at that. Okay, so God is not going to have Miriam in the middle of winter ride a camel or whatever when she's over nine months pregnant, bouncing up and down on a stupid camel or horse. That's just not the way God works. Okay, so that's, again, another proof that didn't happen at Christmas. Look at John 1, 14. The word was made flesh, and what did he do? Oh, amazing, he tabernacled during the Feast of Tabernacles. What a concept. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we see what happened. The word became flesh in John 1, and he dwelt among us, which also is he tabernacled among us. And then look at Luke 2, 13. Suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Can you imagine? Here they're up in heaven. I have night lights over in the Middle East. There's not too many lights. But back then, there was like no lights except over Jerusalem with the lights of the temple menorahs that were there. And the angels, you know, they're saying... Glory to God in the highest and on earth good will toward men. This never would have happened at Passover. This never would have happened at Christmas. This would only have happened during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now here's what is incredible. I want you to think about this. Look at Luke 2, 21. When the eight days were fulfilled for the circumcision of the child, his name was called what? And when do they give children their names? On the eighth day. And most people don't make this connection. He's circumcised on the eighth day, which is the day he gets his name, and he is named Yeshua, which means what? Vation. This was given by the angel before he was even conceived in the womb. So what is happening? Think about this. He's being circumcised on the eighth day. If he was born on Sukkot, that takes you to Shemini Atzeret. The eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And where is he when he's being circumcised? He is in the temple shedding his blood, confirming the covenant to Abraham. On the eighth day. God is the perfect uh, uh, orchestra, director. How can this, I mean, this just shows you there has to be a God. Look at Luke 2, 22 through 24. It says, when the days of their purification, according to the Torah of Moses, were fulfilled. So what were they doing during his time? They were following the Torah. They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the Torah of the Lord, that every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the Torah, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, do you know that is not, that's the truth, but it's not the whole truth. Where do you think you're going to find the whole truth? By going to the Torah, because it says they follow the Torah. So let's go to Leviticus 12, 6 and 8. It says, when the days of our purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she has to bring what? A lamb of the first year is actually what was required for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to the priest. But if they're poor, if they are so poor, she's not able to afford to bring a lamb. Well, then she can bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering and the priest will make atonement for her and she shall be clean. Okay, so what were they supposed to bring? But they couldn't afford a lamb, which also tells you the three magi hadn't come with the money yet. Okay, 
And what else do we see? They were poor. They wish they had had a lamb. They did. They had the lamb of God. They had the lamb of God. They didn't need the lamb. Isn't that just mind-blowing? What time is it? Okay, I'll go just a little bit longer. Now, again, Leviticus 23:33. I'm just going to real quickly highlight some things. The Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the children of Israel. On the 15th day of this seventh month is the Feast of Booze for how many days? Okay, the 15th day of the seventh month. That is Tishri. But what else happens on the 15th day of any month? Full moon. So he was born on a full moon in the light of day. Now, look at this. Deuteronomy 16, 13 through 15. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days. And the day with the Lord is a thousand years. And for 7,000 years, we're dwelling in temporary tabernacles. Okay. But look at this. It says, you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after you have gathered in your corn and your wine, and you what? Shall rejoice. That's a command. It, it, your, God is commanding you to rejoice. Can you imagine that? If you were depressed, that's tough. You have to rejoice because my son's going to be born, and we're going to have a party, and I want everyone to rejoice. In your feast, you, your son, daughter, manservant, maidservant, Levite, stranger, fatherless, widow, seven days you shall keep a solemn feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God shall choose because the Lord your God is going to bless you in all your increase and in all the works of your hands. Therefore, you shall what? Can you imagine a commandment to be happy for seven days? That's got to be hard for some people. Now, look at Luke 23 through 40. It says, on the first day, you're to take the fruit of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of thick trees, willows of the brook, and again, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. These are the uh, lulavs and the etrogs that we've ordered for those that want them, and they'll be coming in shortly. And then look at Leviticus 23, 41 through 44. You have to keep a feast to the Lord for seven days. It's a statute forever throughout your generations. You're to keep it in the seventh month. You have to dwell in booths. For seven days, all who are native born in Israel shall dwell in booths. That your generation may know, I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God. And so Moses declared this to the children of Israel, the appointed feast of the Lord. Okay, I'll be teaching more about this on Sukkot coming up here in a couple of weeks. Look at Zechariah 14. Notice three times he said they have to dwell in booths. Well, look what's coming to a planet near you. In Zechariah 14, 14 through 19, Judah will fight at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the nations are going to be gathered together, the gold, the silver, apparel, and great abundance. Why? If you remember, they plundered the pagans at Passover. They got all the Egyptian stuff. Well, that's going to be a pattern. It's going to repeat again, and all the nations are going to end up bringing their gold and silver and great abundance to Israel. And it says, so will be the plague of the horse, mule, camel, donkey, and all the beasts shall be in these tents is this plague, and it'll come to pass, everyone that is left of all the nations, so in other words, here are your humans that are going to survive the tribulation, which came against Jerusalem, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to do what? Keep the feast of tabernacles. And whoever doesn't come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem and worship the king, the Lord of hosts, they get no rain. And if the family of Egypt doesn't come, they not only get no rain, but they also get the plague wherewith the Lord is going to smite all the heathen that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt, punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, do we get the idea we're supposed to keep the Feast of Tabernacles? Three times. But, of course, we can only do what we can do, so we do what we can do as a memorial and as a reminder of what the feast is all about. It's reading how to ride a bicycle won't help you ride a bicycle. Studying the feast will not help you. You need to do the feast. Then you really begin to understand what they mean. Let me show you this. In 2 Peter 1.16, Peter says, we've not followed cunningly devised fables 
when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach, we were eyewitnesses. Peter saw the second coming in a vision. Look at Matthew 17, 4. When it happened, Peter said to Yeshua at the transfiguration, Lord, it's good for us to be here, if you will. Let us make here three, what? Tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. In other words, that's three Sukkot, three tabernacles. Peter saw his coming will be at the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why he's building three uh, Sukkahs. It's not going to happen in the spring. All these fall feasts will be fulfilled in the fall. Okay, Exodus 25, 8 and 9. He says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to the pattern of the tabernacle. God always uses patterns. We have to learn his pattern. Revelation 21, 1 through 4, what do we see? John says, I saw the city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. This is why Zechariah 14, that's to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, because Yeshua is going to be here at the Feast of Tabernacles and he'll reign for a thousand years. And the tabernacle of God is with men. Numbers 29, 12, and 13, on the 15th day of the 17th month, it goes on to say that they're to offer 13 bulls from the herd. Why do they offer the 13 bulls? Anyone know why on the first day they're to offer 13 bulls? It goes on by the eighth or seventh day, they've offered 70 bulls. Okay, they're to offer 13, then 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, and it comes to 70 bulls. Yom Kippur is only for the nation of Israel. They would make atonement for themselves. So five days later on Sukkot, they would make atonement for the 70 nations. So Yom Kippur is only about Israel. It's not about anyone else. And Sukkot is all about the nations. God having Israel as the priests of the world making atonement for the nations. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, the sages often say that if the nations had only known what God was doing for them during Sukkot, making atonement, they never would have destroyed the temple. They'd have put their armies around it to protect it. But isn't that smart? The devil uses the very thing we hate and want to destroy is the very thing that could have helped us. So we'll close with this. Let me just say that uh, the celebrations in the temple, like I said, there are over 2 million people in Jerusalem. And those who arrived there came to what? Rejoice. All right. Uh, the focus was the water libation. In the temple, there was this women's court. You can see the big candlesticks. There were four of those. And that's where the priests would get ladders and they would climb up and they'd have uh, like seven gallon barrels of oil and they would use it to dump into those. They'd have the priestly garments cut in strips for wicks. But it was a huge party. This is the women's court. The women were in the elevated balconies there. And then the men were down dance, dancing down below. There'd be these two priests that are coming and they'd be blowing shofars literally all night long. The events would go and there'd be millions of people there. So here they would all be building sukkahs. There were sukkahs built all over Jerusalem, all the way to Bethlehem. They had sukkahs. Everyone's supposed to be in a sukkah. And then look at Exodus 15 too. It says, the Lord is my strength and my song and he's become what? Remember, this is the song at the sea when they crossed the Red Sea during Passover week. And what do we find? Psalms 118, which is the Hallel, which they sing. That has the same verse. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has what? Become my salvation. And so what do we see? During that week, they not only sing Psalm 118, they also sing Isaiah 12.2. Why? Because Isaiah 12, 2 is the only other place where it says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For God, the Lord, is my strength and my song, and he has become my Yeshua. And what happens? That happens on the Feast of Tabernacles. God has become their Yeshua. And what else do we see? The next verses. Therefore, with joy will you draw water out of the wells of... Salve or Yeshua. That's why in John chapter 7, when they were all singing, 
they were singing, this is what they were singing, and the minute they sang, with joy will you draw waters out of the wells of salvation, that's when Yeshua interrupted the whole song service and said, yes, as this scripture says, whoever comes to me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It was on the feast of Sukkot when they're singing this that he interrupts them in John chapter 7. This is what they're singing. Why is that so amazing? Because look at the last verse. There's only six verses. The very next thing. On the Feast of Tabernacles. <gasps> Cry and shout out, you inhabitant of Zion, for great in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Here he was born at Sukkot. Now he's ministering as an adult and he interrupts their song service and he says, yes, come to me. Well, guess what? Now they have to finish the song and it is cry and shout out, great in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Unless you know the Hebraic roots and haven't followed replacement theology, you're never going to see all this. But wait, there's more. I'll teach on Sukkot. So then you rejoice in the Torah. And that's what they're doing. They're rejoicing in the living Torah, Messiah, during the Feast of Sukkot. This is why he couldn't have been born on Passover. All right? But look at this. I'm closing with this. How many years in a Shemitah cycle? Okay, I want all of you online to record this. Watch it. Put it in your notes. Don't forget it. Because this isn't in your notes. Okay, there's seven years in a Shemitah cycle, right? Okay, so I have down here. 1911, 1912, 13, 14, 15, 16, 1917 was a Shemitah year. Now, the first thing, people use this, but there's a big problem with this. Some people will say uh, 1917 was a Jubilee year, and so was 1967, which is 50 years later, because they see in 1917, was World War I and Jerusalem was recaptured and 67 Jerusalem's recaptured and that's 50 years apart. So they say that must be a Jubilee year. Wrong. Completely wrong. As you look at the Shemitah years, everyone knows 2001 was a Shemitah year, but here's the problem with this calendar. How many of you knew, know God does not use our pagan Gregorian calendar? If you say that 2001 was a Shemitah year, you have to ask yourself, well, was it the first nine months of 2001 or the last three months of 2001? Because a biblical year begins at Rosh Hashanah, which is in September, October. So 2001, in one sense, can't be a Shemitah year because you haven't defined it enough. Is it the first half of 2001 or the last half of 2001? So anyone that gives you a calendar date based on our years, they don't know what they're talking about. You following me? Okay, but we're going to pretend we're going to use this for the moment because that's what people use that don't know what they're talking about. Okay, but 2001 people recognize as a Shemitah year and 2008 and 2015 and last, uh, the year before, 2022 was a Shemitah year. Pretty much everybody believes that it was a Shemitah year. Now, the way you know it was a Shemitah year on the biblical calendar Okay, we've now entered 5784. So what was this past year? 5783. And what was the year before that? 82. Well, we know 5782 was a Shemitah year because 5782 is divisible by seven. Christians make it too hard. We also know 5782 was the 49th year of the seven sevens because 5782 is also divisible by 49. So if 5782 is divisible by 49, the following year is a jubilee year, which means we've just left a jubilee year of 5783 and we're now entering 5784. Okay, is everyone following me so far? Kind of, hopefully. Now, there are people prophetic people in the messianic world who are convinced that 1917 was a jubilee year. 1967 was a jubilee year. Therefore, 2017 has to be a jubilee year. That's nuts. Just because they're 50 years apart. I mean, if you've been married 50 years, does that mean your first year was a year of jubilee and your 50th year is a year of jubilee biblically? No, it just means 
50 years have gone by. The reason 2017 can't be a Jubilee year is because it's the second year of a Shemitah cycle. How can, how can a Jubilee year be in the middle of a Shemitah cycle? It has to be at the end of a Shemitah cycle the following year. You follow, is everyone following me? Okay, who's not following me? I want to explain it. Okay. This is the first year of a Shemitah cycle. The second, the third, the fourth, the sixth, the seventh. What is seven times seven? Which means that next year is a Jubilee year. So therefore, none of the Shemitah years can be a Jubilee year. Are you following me? Because it's the seventh year. It's supposed to be following a Shemitah cycle. It's the 50th year. 50, 50 is not a multiple of seven. Okay, so you have seven and another seven, another seven, another, and you do seven sevens, and then the next year is the Jubilee year. That next year is the first year of a new cycle. Okay, and so 2023, what we just left was the 50th year after you do the seven times seven. The 50th year is also the first year of the next cycle. It's not a separate year. Just like the Sabbath, uh, you can't add uh, Moomba Boomba Day, okay, in the counting of the Omer. I mean, the, the fir- just like Sunday is the first day of the week, it's also the eighth day of the week. You follow me? So the Jubilee year was never a separate year. It was always the first year uh, after the seven sevens. So last year was a Jubilee year because the Jubilee years have to be in the first year of a Shemitah cycle. They can't be in the seventh year. So anyway, I just wanted to put this chart so you could see why the year of Jubilee could never be 1917, could never be 2017. It's all about the math. Okay, how in the world could a Jubilee ever be the second year of a Shemitah cycle? It can't. So 2017, 1967, 1917 could never be biblical jubilees. Jubilees are not based on a January to January calendar, as I just said. How in the world could a Shemitah year also be a year of jubilee? So do you see how dumb it is if you're not following the math? Now let me show you one more thing about people who believe he was born at Passover instead of Sukkot. I have so many biblical reasons, but I'm going to give you one of the smartest reasons that prove how dumb it is to think he was born at Passover. How many years did he minister? Three and a half, right? Well, get a load of this. He was three and a half years that he ministered. And it says, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. If he ministered three and a half years, and he was about 30 years old, it says he began his ministry right at his birthday. That's what it says. And we know he began on the first of Elul. For 40 days, he was in the wilderness, comes out on Yom Kippur. Okay, and what do we see? If he was actually born at Passover, his ministry would have started at Passover. So he has one Passover, two Passover, three Passovers, and the half a year says he dies on Sukkot then. That doesn't work. But if he was born on Sukkot and started his ministry on Sukkot and he ministers three and a half years, he now dies on Passover. Does that make sense? That's what I'm saying. It's so much common sense as to why he wasn't born on Passover as some famous people say. He was born on Sukkot. Okay, with that said, let's stand.